Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of GSO Ocean Classroom Live, our last episode in our 2020 season. Hello to all of our audiences that are out there on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, Periscope, which is through Twitter. And as always, thank you to the Devereaux Ocean Foundation for its generous support and funding today's episode. My name is Holly Morin. I'm a marine biologist and a science communicator at the Inner Space Center uh, at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography and I will again be your host today. Uh, also again, we really want uh, this episode to be conversational. So your input, your questions, they're really important um, to uh, important contributions to the success of today's program. So you can type in your questions, your comments at any time in the chat box that is gonna be there uh, on Facebook, uh, under the video player, as well as on YouTube, um, if you're watching from either of those platforms. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions today as possible. I'm actually gonna kick things off with a question for you all. Where are you all tuning in from today? Uh, what city, what state? Are you hunkering down like clearly I was in Rhode Island with the snowstorm that we have coming through the area? Or perhaps you're somewhere uh, warmer, somewhere sunnier. Uh, please definitely type in your location, say hello to us uh, in that chat box there. Uh, and while you're doing that, while you're uh, typing in your answers, letting us know where you're tuning in from today, uh, one quick reminder to make sure that you follow along uh, with the Graduate School of Oceanography and the Inner Space Center uh, on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, also Twitter, all the different social media handles, uh, Instagram as well. So you can stay up to date not only on episodes such as this, but other activities that might be happening. Um, what are our plans for 2021? How are you going to know? Uh, so definitely tune in via social media, uh, follow along so you can get those updates. Uh, and thanks if you're watching the replay. You can type in any questions that you might have uh, and we can get back to those as well uh, after the fact. We do look at things. So uh, definitely keep those questions and everything coming uh, either now during today's program or after the fact too. So uh, where are you all tuning in from today? Hopefully you've been typing those things in. If there's any answers, we'll bring those up. Uh, but while you guys are still letting us know where you're tuning in from today, um, we're gonna be, this is, today's episode is the final episode in a four part series that's been exploring all the different paths that you can take towards a future in ocean science. So there've been three other episodes uh, and we have connected with undergraduate students, with graduate students, faculty members, researchers. And then our last episode, we were speaking with some ship technicians and other uh, support, support personnel that are going out to sea. So uh, today we're connecting with uh, three GSO alums. So we're gonna kind of round out that journey um, and talk about the different steps. It's kind of nice that they actually are gonna kind of sum up all the different steps from those previous episodes, talk about maybe some of the challenges they experienced, what worked, what didn't work, uh, what type of networking um, did they do? Um, and the great thing is, is these are all three different alums of the Graduate School of Oceanography, but they've taken three very different paths into a career um, in ocean science postgraduate school, which I think is fantastic. So all of you tuning in today, you're gonna get a really great perspective, a nice broad interest perspective on what you can do with an ocean science career, uh, what really is possible. Um, so it's, again, really awesome to have these different individuals that are joining us today, to have those three unique outlooks um, that are going to be shared with all of you. So let's get to know our guests. Um, so first up, we have Dr. Leslie Smith. Oh, Gary, you are from Snowy Marblehead, Mass. Yes. Minneapolis, Minnesota. I wonder if you're as snowy as we are right now in Rhode Island before. That's great. Also coming in from Rhode Island, looking forward to today's program. Awesome, thanks Diane, we're happy to have you joining us today. Snowy Narragansett, yep, snowy North Kingstown is where I am. Knoxville, Tennessee, fantastic. This is Leslie, we've got somebody tuning in from your neck of the woods. Uh, Fairfax. <laughs> they'll, they'll be my wife upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, my, my sisters usually tune in. My family is always usually tuning into these as well. It's all good, it's great. So this is Leslie Smith, um, he's one of our guests today, Dr. Leslie Smith. She graduated from GSO in 2011 with her doctorate in oceanography. Um, and she was looking at hypoxia or low oxygen areas in Narragansett Bay. Uh, now she actually runs her own consulting company, your own ocean consulting LLC. So Leslie, why don't you say hello to our audiences and tell them a little bit more about uh, your current career. All right, well, hello everyone. And thank you all for joining us uh, from snowy Rhode Island down to where I am in sunny Tennessee. Um, so I run my own consulting company focusing on science communications and community engagement, uh, whether that is scientists communicating their science to other scientists or to non-scientific audiences like school children, the public, or policymakers. 
Um, so through that, I can work on a lot of different projects and use a lot of different parts of my brain. I can use the science side and work on technical writing or data analysis. I can use the artistic side and do graphic design or website development. And then the social side and plan engagement events to connect people to scientists and connect scientists from around the world from maybe different disciplines uh, together to tackle one problem. Awesome. Thanks, Leslie. That's great. A lot of different things going on there, which I really appreciate. So next we have Dr. Autumn Oskowski, and hopefully I didn't completely butcher your last name on, and I realized that. Um, no. She graduated... Perfect. She graduated with her biological oceanography doctorate in 2009, again from GSO. Um, and she considers herself a classic coastal scientist, which I love that, uh, and conducts a lot of different coastal research activities with the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, uh, Atlantic Coastal Environmental Sciences Division in Narragansett, Rhode Island. So right there in the same campus, basically, as GSO. So you graduated and didn't go very far, Autumn, which is, that's perfectly fine. So why don't you say hello and let everybody know a little bit more about your career path? Hi, everybody. Yep, I'm Autumn. I did my PhD at GSO, and we prepared to move to some far flung place for a job, and we ended up, we sold all of our used couches and old stuff that we accumulated over grad school. We ended up moving um, about 100 yards north. Um, so I'm at the EPA lab, which is also on the Bay Campus. And so, yeah, I'm a coastal ecologist. I use biogeochemistry a lot. Um, Basically, um, I help the EPA by better understanding environmental problems in coastal areas. And so, Awesome. Thanks. And I'm sure we'll dive a little bit more into that in a little bit. So lastly, we have Anupa Sokan, who graduated in 2012 uh, from the University of Rhode Island's uh, GSO, their Blue MBA program, which I think is uh, really interesting and something to definitely highlight for folks in case they're not aware of it. It's where you can graduate, you combine a Master of Business Administration uh, degree with a Master's in Oceanography. So you combine with those two and graduate with an, a Blue MBA. And so uh, she now leads uh, ocean conserv an Ocean Conservation Conservation for the World Surf League. Um, so that's their uh, their nonprofit arm, so WSL Pure. Uh, so Anupa, why don't you say hello um, to our audiences, tell them a little bit more about the World Surf League and then the initiatives you're managing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'm currently working for the World Surf League's nonprofit, WSL Pure. If you're not familiar with the World Surf League, they're essentially the professional sports league for professional surfing. So they put the world's best surfers on the world's best waves. Um, and I help support um, some of their, um, I guess, conservation efforts that they're doing. So Pure helps push forward a lot of their sustainability initiatives through the league, whether that's reducing plastics or offsetting um, the, the athletes and the staff's carbon footprint throughout the year on all their travels. Um, but what I'm working on right now is really exciting because in, well, hopefully next year, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity is going to be setting some targets for how we protect the ocean and how we use our global ocean. So I'm helping lead a campaign of a ton of nonprofits, some companies that are really interested to help um, get public support to protect 30% of our ocean by the year 2030, which is really exciting. That is really exciting. That's fantastic. So that's all great. This is great. I'm so excited. Um, so thank you for those great introductions. And a reminder to our audiences that we really want this to be a conversation. So the four of us will be chatting, but you're all part of this conversation too. So remember to ask your questions at any time. You can just type them into the comment box under the Facebook video player or in the chat box that's there uh, for uh, YouTube as well. And um, it could be anything. If you're curious about their backgrounds, our guests, uh, their, their experiences, what's required to do their job, what they like to eat for breakfast, right? You can ask any question fair game um, and we'll get to as many as we can today. So I'm going to start off with a question for our, all of you. Um, and you know, you guys are at this point in your careers right now, but that, let's rewind. I can't make that cool rewind sound effect. I wish I could, but I can't. Um, so if we rewind way back when, uh, what got you started? Like I'm the quintessential marine mammal person, right? I liked dinosaurs forever when I was little. And then I went on a whale watch in seventh grade. I saw a humpback whale and I said, that's it. That's what I'm going to work on. That's what I'm going to study. And I did to some extent, but then my path got me here. But what was it for all of you all? Like what, Leslie, what started with you? What, how did you, did, is this what you knew you wanted to do at a young age? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting because 
when I knew I wanted to do at a young age. And then I took a swerve away from it and then I came back to it. So let's start at a young age. This would be a piece of artwork that I put together when I was 11. The prompt was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so I drew a picture of myself uh, standing on the bow of a ship with dolphins and a setting sun as an oceanographer during research. But then I also somehow knew that part of it would involve data analysis and sitting at a computer. Um, so I've always been really interested in the natural world. I grew up uh, going to the Chesapeake Bay a lot as a kid. My family has a cabin down there and we would spend a lot of time uh, kayaking and canoeing and going crabbing. Um, and it just really instilled in me this desire to protect our natural world. And so as I grew up, I saw things changing. I saw erosion. I saw blue crab populations declining and it made me really sad and I wanted to help it. And so I knew I wanted to be someone to help make a change and help clean up these areas that I love so much. Awesome. Thanks so much. What about the rest of you? Autumn, was this, was this your pathway when you starting out? <laughs> <laughs> so there's Leslie and then there's me. <laughs> so this is something I dug up for this. It says, um, if I could be anyone else, I would be Madonna. Um, and if I wore a peacock, and so that was me in fourth grade. So remember Leslie's picture, um, and this is Autumn's um, career aspirations. And so I love that it says I am what I am, though. That's what you titled it. You know, Madonna and a peacock are not bad, you know, aspirations to have for sure. <laughs> yes. No, it's funny because, yeah, it, I didn't know that this kind of a job was like even an option. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody who was academic or who had a, even really graduate school or I think, you know, this, it wasn't until college that I took a geology course and it was like waking up. I was like, oh my gosh, like we took this course and we walked around outside and the professor was explaining like why the rocks were there and why the mountains looked the way they did and why the stream was moving the way it did and what, what direction it was going in. And it was like, it's like, I mean, awakening to understanding like why things were the way they were on the earth and that, that just was what set me on the path and the other piece is that um some children like love science and math growing up that was that wasn't me i really liked english um and i really liked reading and i really liked mystery stories oh well, there i am i'm the one um with my hand under my chin. And um, what I realized in college is that science is a lot of solving mysteries. Exactly. And that's what we do as scientists is we essentially solve mysteries. I love that. And I don't, I tell people all the time too, I mean, it's not something that I want to be like, hey, but I don't like math either. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to, you know, I, I love science, don't like math. Um, and they kind of go hand in hand, right? Um, and I was able to still be successful. I had to work a little harder at that math. It's not something I, I love to do. Even now, my son was asking this morning to help me with fractions. And I was like, nope, you can go find daddy. So it's, it's okay, right? Um, and there are different ways you can achieve uh, an ocean science and marine science career without necessarily all these things and buckets that you think you have to file things into. Uh, it doesn't sure. necessarily work that way. Yeah, or even like sometimes we tend to think when we're trying to figure things out, like, well, I, you know, I... I don't think I like science or math. And in reality, um, that's not, I mean, it's called a scientist, but that's not the full part of a career of a scientist. A career, like somebody who's a scientist has to think creatively and think independently and pose interesting and useful and important questions. And so you can be really good at math or like really good at like technical science and know your chemistry. But if, if you don't know how to ask good questions and look at data and and work through it, there's like a sort of an independent thinking creative process there that that is really critical. Yeah, and Anupa, I think that might come into where into your world too when you're you're talking or with different people and you're asking questions for these, you kind of have a different angle if I think about it um, when you're looking at marine science maybe just because of the fact that um, these different campaigns that you're working with nonprofits, um, it's a, it, it, is that something that you feel that that type of tapping into the, the science but also that creative question side of things, is that something that you're definitely using um, in your line of work? 
Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I was just thinking um, after uh, my undergrad, actually, I spent some time teaching marine science um, on this island called Catalina off the coast of um, Los Angeles. And I was just thinking about, you know, really learning marine science and like being in that environment teaching it is how you <laughs> how you get there because kids just are are curious and ask the best questions and it kind of forces you to think about things in new ways and I was thinking about that a little bit more and really like the job of a scientist is you've just kind of held on to that curiosity um, I think sometimes we forget to be curious um, mm -hmm. as we were when we were younger mm -hmm. but as a scientist you're doing that and it's just formalized it's the scientific method and that's what you're you know working through um, to answer questions that you have about the world around you. Most definitely. I think I just got goosebumps. I'm like, I could be cold, but I think that was just like, that was spot on Anuba. Thank you so much. And then where you're talking about your experiences in Catalina Island, that kind of weaves into other experience we've had. And a reminder to everybody, we're going to keep chatting, but you all need to ask some questions so that we can weave all of your um, input into this conversation. Um, and those will be put up on the screen and we'll answer as many questions as we can. Uh, but Leslie, what were your experiences? I know you actually, if I remember correctly, you went and had an internship after you graduated, I think. Well, you had an internship during. You were, I think it was a program you joined with Metcalf, which is at, um, G at URI. But then if I remember it was, um, oh, it was a was it the consortium? It was COL, which I'm trying to remember what that stands for. Yeah, yep. Consortium for Ocean Leaders. Yes. So I think these different experiences, we're gonna talk about that. It's not just, you know, the academics, but all these other experiences like Anupa was leading, talking about hers at Catalina Island. What are some of the ones that you've had? Yeah, so, um... Well, I guess going first off, taking it way back right after I drew that picture, um, I got to do a summer internship at VIMS, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, as part of the Virginia Governor's School as a high school student. And so that was really cool to get to do real research for a summer. Um, so all the high school students out there, if you're interested, find a summer internship. It might be volunteer, but at least then you can get your hands wet and you can be like, this isn't for me or like, I figured out my career path. Um, and so then while I was at grad school, I was an iGroup fellow, which paired me up as an NSF fellowship and it paired me up with people from economics and fisheries and biology and communications. And we tried to tackle large coastal management issues. And so that was this big awakening for me because I was like, just stop fishing the lobsters. Oh, wait, they're important for the economy and people's sense of place and who they are. And it's a bigger picture. And then my brain exploded a little bit. And, um, you know, so it's just all these things give you a diversity in perspective um, that I think is really powerful and kind of framing who you are. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and I just had my doorbell ring because this is live TV and this is my son about to come in from the storm and I completely predicted this. Um, but we actually have a question. So I am going to bring, let's bring up that question and I'm going to field it to you guys. So uh, Jerry says, I love the book Mapping the Deep by Robert Kunzig, Exploring the Ocean Floor. There's the dog. Do you suggest <laughs> et cetera, which cover the ocean floor? Thanks. So I'm going to let you all talk about book suggestions, and I'm going to go try to manage my son really quickly. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. Shipwreck Hunter. Has anyone read that by David Mearns? That's a great mm -hmm. book that talks about um, his work mapping the seafloor. So before I was with the World Surf League, I was actually working at XPRIZE with their ocean initiative. And XPRIZE led a um, global competition, an incentivized prize competition for new technology to map the seafloor autonomously and to a higher resolution than we've been able to do before. Um, so in um, David's book, he kind of talks about the history of mapping the seafloor leading up to that XPRIZE, which will theoretically allow the, the technology that won that prize will take us from, you know, maybe 400 years to map the seafloor with the technology we had before to being able to do that within 10 years, if we can get that out on the market, which is pretty cool. That's amazing. I'm not yeah. sure if everyone in the audience knows this, but we actually know less about the seafloor than we do about the moon. Like we have a better map of what the moon looks yeah. like than the seafloor. So this is a huge area. Um, it's, it's the next frontier, really, of discovery is the deep ocean and what's going on at the bottom. Yeah, I always think it's so to kind of put that in perspective, like if you're oh, sorry. no, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Um, go to back, sorry. I was gonna say, like, if you look at Google Maps to find where you're going, right? Like the the resolution, like it's very pixelated when we look at mm -hmm. our maps of the seafloor. So if you're looking at your neighborhood, you probably wouldn't be able to see your street. You probably wouldn't be able to see your block. Like we'd be looking at multiple blocks around you um, and it would all look the same. So we have really bad maps of most of our seafloor. And so that's why it's hard to find, you know, when a plane goes down and gets lost. Mm -hmm. um, that's why there's a ton of shipwrecks out there that we haven't been able to find because we just don't know what's down there and what the different features are. No, yeah, what I was gonna say is I can't remember what exactly the percentage is when you think of the Gulf of Mexico and how much oil and gas exploration that has happened there and there's all these different oil rigs, but there's still, it's something like only the size of the state of Delaware or something very small. I can't remember what the scale was has been actually explored or mapped to that resolution. And so you have this area that's that's been heavily exploited, but still we know so very little about. That's always like, it, it kind of, it gives you context to how much how little of the seafloor has been mapped and and really visualized, and that's why these the the um, seabed 2030 effort is so important in getting all that data and, and mapping. Um, so, um, all right, so let's go back, Autumn. We didn't get to hear from you in the midst of my craziness with my son coming in the front door. Um, did you any experiences or um, that you'd like to share with folks that you had? I know you were talking about that geology class that that's when you kind of had your awakening, which I love. Um, that was there, or maybe there was a mentor, was there somebody that really kind of helped you along the way? Um, I was thinking about this. So we talked a little bit about ahead of time about these things. And um, so when I was in college, I had like a work study with a um, woman who was working with some other folks to turn this arboretum into like an educational environmental stewardship mm -hmm. facility. And that was an amazing experience. But what was also interesting was that um, this group of people had taken these fairly like circuitous paths to get where they were. And they were, you know, they weren't doing the whole like, you know, go to, go to graduate high school, go to college, get a job, like get married, like, you know, work at your job till you retire, which is wonderful. But they just, they, I had no exposure to people who did anything other than that. And so it was really interesting to see how these people did live these very different lifestyles where they worked in one place for a while and they worked in a different place. And so that was a real eye opener. This is a picture of me as an undergrad, I was like 20, um, taking some mangrove cores from South Florida. Um, so yeah. No, that's great. That actually is a, a kind of a nice um, segue into um, the next question I have for all of you is, you know, so you're, you've gone through your undergrad, you've gone through your graduate degree, you've, you've kind of made this path into this current position that you're in. Is it, is it what you expected? So we flash back to that drawing that Leslie had, you know, of do you, are you out on a ship with dolphins and, you know, yo ho ho, or, you know, what is it, you know, or was that path different than what you expected? I know from, for me, I know that my path, if you had told me way back when, you know, I thought starting out, okay, I'm going to go study whales that, you know, I'm going to be in the Antarctic and the Arctic within three months of each other doing live interactions from a ship and sharing with people, my excitement for the ocean. If you told me that was something I was going to do, I would have been like, no, I didn't even know you could do that. It's kind of what you were saying, Autumn. And my path definitely was not A to B. It's been A to B to C to D. You know, I've done a research. I've been, I worked at NOAA for four years and then I've been at GSO for the last 12. So um, what do y'all think? So Leslie, since you had that fantastical picture, is this, was it what you expected? Is, is this where you thought you would be or has it been a, a straight line path? Kind of like what Autumn was talking about with those folks that she worked with. Yeah, so the interesting thing is, is that out of all of us, I'm the one who drew that picture of me being a scientist out on the boat doing science. But a lot of what I do is science communication, and I really don't do much research. And I love math. Like, math is the best. So it's just really ironic. So we need to take a step back to college to get a little context here. For the, my first two years of college, I actually wasn't a science major. After all that, after the internship at VIMS, the picture, I actually was a philosophy major taking philosophy, psychology, and education classes because I didn't, um, I went to a small college and I couldn't, the, the course that I needed to get into for biology had filled up. So I couldn't get into it. This was like an entry level course. 
And so I didn't take biology. And instead, I took a course about Rene Descartes, the famous philosopher, you know, um, I think therefore I am and I fell in love with it. And so I continued on this path for the first two years. And then I went with a college friend out to Yosemite National Park. and was like, Oh, my God, I had this existential crisis, I need to get back to science. And so then I took my very first biology class in college, my junior year. So my pet, so with that context of the philosophy and the writing and the deep thinking that combined with my oceanography passion is what led me to where I am. And it took my diversity and interest in this seemingly straight path with a huge swerve in the middle of it in college to kind of get where I am. Um, so I don't know if this is where I expected I would end up, but um, as my mom likes to say, when I was little, she couldn't imagine me in a real job because I liked too many different things and I kind of, I didn't want to be in any one box. And so now that I'm a freelance consultant doing a ton of different stuff, working with a ton of different people, she's like, oh yeah, this is the job I could see you doing. <laughs> Actually, we have a, a question that kind of lives in that realm of what you're talking about, touches on what you're talking about right now, Leslie. So, um, and I will, I'm going to say it and then we'll see who wants to um, field it. So this is from Lilia. Do you feel overwhelmed by the number of opportunities or paths you can go down with your background and experiences? It's an absolutely fantastic question. I'm going to be honest. That's a great question because there are a lot of different things that you can do. Um, and I kind of feel like I would go down one path. And they'd be like, hmm, and then back and go try something else. And but for me, all along, I was always doing, it's kind of like what you're talking about, Leslie, I was always doing science and communication. Um, even when I was a camp counselor, when I was 18 at Audubon, I was working with kids. And then I was doing all different types of outreach. And then I realized, aha, this is what I should be doing. This is where my niche is. So um, Anupa, did you, because you've got kind of a dual degree. So maybe you've got yeah. double the pleasure. I don't know. So was it overwhelming for you to kind of figure things out? I, I think so. And I think that's why I did the dual degree because I wasn't ready to commit to one thing. <laughs> um, and actually, I, if I go back even further, I originally went to college to go to film school. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do. I loved math and science, but I still wanted to go that more, I guess, creative route. Um, and I dabbled in a couple of different things and went back to like that oceanography class. I took my first semester of um, college and that's what I ended up choosing as my major. And even from there, I don't think I realized the number of career paths. Like it's not necessarily just, you know, um, research or working in a lab and kind of doing that more um, traditional science uh, career. Um, there are these amazing positions in marine policy um, and kind of working with decision makers and helping them translate the science um, to make, you know, great policy decisions that affect all of us every day. There's so many different paths and I've dabbled in a lot of them. Um, I've worked in marine policy. This is me leading a briefing on Capitol Hill, actually, um, for the House Oceans Caucus. Mm -hmm. Um, I've worked in uh, science education. I've worked in communications for the federal government. I was at NOAA for a couple of years and actually doing um, communications coaching with scientists. So there's there's a lot of different opportunities, but I think each at each point you figure out what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And I think the key word here is that it's a path, right? Like it doesn't have to be um, this overwhelming thing. I think you just find the thing that is interesting to you and find the place where you can kind of bring your skill set and help push that mission forward. So to me, I'm just doing what I can to help the ocean and finding the places where I can kind of do that work and feel like I'm contributing to it. That's fantastic. That all that that you just those are all the things I always tell people. Use I love that you use the word dabble too, because nobody ever I feel like uses the word dabble, but that's exactly what along this path, I think I tell people all the time because you'll figure out what you like, but also what you don't like. Um, I, the example I always give is when I was an undergrad, um, I was doing a work study in a lab looking at Daphnia, which are these little tiny uh, plankturous uh, invertebrates and they eat algae and I was supposed to be counting how many algae they little little circular algae they had in their guts um, and I realized one my eyes are not meant to look in a microscope my eyelashes are too long and it was really hard and two it was just really hard to look at these super tiny things for long periods of time and I was like okay this is not necessarily what I want to do and that was okay um, that was a good experience for me in just learning that right so um, one so we're getting close to 1230 so that means we're gonna be wrapping things up shortly 
shortly. But I wanted to ask um, our three guests one last question. You know, where do you see the future? I, I, as we're, you know, we're wrapping up this four part series, talking about all the path that we've taken from start to, to end here. And you guys are in these positions. What do you, what do you see your future of, of ocean science? Where are you headed? What do you think? Autumn, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, everything is in, but yeah. viewed for, from our own lenses of what we value and what we think is important. And I think um, I see uh, the future of some portion or a, a greater portion of brain science going towards making sure that we do a better, more thoughtful job of connecting people with these environmental problems. And so we are moving away from doing science because it's cool and interesting and really the focus is shifting towards what do people need? Um, what do they need in other places other than right where we live? What can we do to help both the environment and the communities that live in them? And those sorts of um, human ecological coupling questions, especially with changing climate and um, human loads of different things to the coastal areas. Awesome. I love that. That not just doing science because it's science, but doing it because you want to connect people and inform them better. And I think that's great. Leslie, what do you think? What is the future? Do you have a picture? Do you draw up a picture of what the future is going to look like? <laughs> I wish, right? Um, so I think the future, I, I, I have it in my head summed up as triple D, direct. We are going to be able to directly connect ocean observations to management and to people and directly download the data, almost like a weather station. We, you know, that's in uh, deep. We already talked about this. That's our next frontier. We don't know a lot about the deep ocean, but it's really important in climate. It's really important in fisheries. Um, and the last one is diverse. Oceanography is about to explode in diversity, people from different backgrounds, people with different interests. Just looking at the diversity of careers available. You know, if you think about what stems creativity, it's diversity of perspective. Love it. Love it. Anupa, final remarks from you. What do you think? Future of marine ocean science. Where are we going? I well, building on both um, what Autumn and Leslie have said, I think that um, there's this new understanding of how intricately, intricately connected all of us are to the ocean, whether you live on the coast or whether you live in the middle of a country. Um, and with that, I think on the business side, there's going to be a lot more, there are going to be a lot more opportunities to kind of um, take that information and that knowledge and build from it. Um, and I think there'll be more jobs <laughs> in the ocean field in different places that you didn't expect before. So I think being able to combine degrees like I was able to do with the Blue MBA or just having an understanding of basic ocean science and some other um, sector will be really important and open up a lot more doors than it maybe was able to do for you in the past. Awesome. I, and that This is fantastic. I couldn't have asked for three better responses to that question, honestly. And I think that this is a really great place to wrap things up. Um, and um, thank you to the three of you today for joining us. Thank you so much for your perspectives. They're um, really, I appreciate them. I'm sure our audiences appreciate them. You shared a lot of really fantastic information and insight. Um, and thank you for everybody who did take the time to join us today. Hopefully, if you're thinking about a career in ocean science, um, you know, this has given you a little bit more information and, and that kind of oomph to push you forward um, and to pursue things in a lot of different ways, right? There's all different ways that you can go after this career in ocean science. And even that film career that Anupa was talking about that she was interested in, that's part of this too. There are folks behind the scenes at the Interspace Center that are making these productions happen. Um, and I know Jess is actually, she's a wildlife, she was a wildlife major at URI and she's got both of those going on. She did the, that basically a film background and a wildlife sciences background. So there's basically any way you want to spin it, you can make this happen as long as you have the patience um, and you figure out what you like and don't like dabble. I'm gonna, I always tell people that all the time. I love that word. Um, so hopefully, um, uh, anybody who's interested, you guys will all have that enthusiasm to, to kind of push things forward. Um, so again, thanks for the three of you for sharing everything today. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again to the Deborah Ocean Foundation for their support. Um, and thank you to our audiences, as always, for taking the time to join us. This is our final episode of the GSO Ocean Classroom Live 2020 series. Um, and I, I know I don't just speak for myself in saying that I think it's been a really great uh, series of broadcasts. We've connected with a whole host 
of different ocean science stakeholders um, and been able to share a lot of different stories uh, with our audiences out on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever else ends up getting broadcast. So um, if our audiences have joined us for multiple broadcasts, thank you so very much. If this was your first episode with us, Thanks for taking the time to join us today as well. Um, Leslie, Anupa, Autumn, thank you. I don't know if you guys have any parting words or that you would like to share with the group. Otherwise, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know there's been a lot of websites, uh, links that have been shared in the comments today. Uh, check those out uh, for all the different projects that were discussed. And remember to follow along with uh, URI GSO, the Interspace Center on social media. Um, and if there are other programs you might be interested in, let us know. There'll be a comment form for you all to fill out after the fact. But otherwise, Thank you so much to all of you. Be well, be safe, happy holidays, happy new year. <laughs> Have a great one.